Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say uh, how inspiring uh, and humbling it is uh, to be in a room packed full of so many movers uh, and shakers uh, of our world. Uh, listening to some of the great talks the past few days, it's been intellectually stimulating uh, and I think gives us very, very big reason to be excited uh, about the future. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your ideas and a special thanks to uh, Singularity University and, and for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to really share and discuss and connect the dots. Uh, so today, uh, I'd like to talk to you about 3D printing uh, living human tissue and how I believe uh, it will fundamentally change the way we practice medicine and move us towards uh, personalizing uh, medicine. But before I get into 3D printing living human tissue, uh, I want to start off with uh, a, a key reminder of the strong promise uh, of cell and organ therapy. So this picture uh, is a picture of the very first successful donor organ transplant. Uh, this was conducted in the 1950s. In this procedure, uh, Dr. Joseph Murray and his team successfully harvested uh, a kidney and uh, transplanted that into a patient saving their lives. It was undoubtedly a, a massive medical achievement of our time, one which led to uh, Dr. Joseph Murray uh, winning the Nobel Prize for medicine several years later. On the uh, right uh, hand side is a uh, photo that uh, I'm especially proud of as a Canadian. So these are eight patients uh, in, in Canada that were treated from type one diabetes via the Edmonton protocol. And so this was a protocol that was pioneered uh, in Edmonton, Alberta, where they took donor islets. Uh, so these are the cells that produce insulin. Uh, they were taken from these donors and put into these diabetic patients, uh, and then these eight patients were cured from type 1 diabetes, so they no longer have to live their lives uh, with uh, insulin injections. And so these serve as two amazing reminders of the true promise uh, of cell uh, and organ therapy. And now comes the stark uh, reality and the massive shortage of donor organs uh, that, we, that we face. Uh, and so we're faced with an increasing gap between donor organ supply uh, and demand. In the United States alone, about 120,000 people are on the donor organ wait list. Uh, and every single day, about 20 people die waiting for a donor organ. Not only that, uh, if a patient is uh, successful and, and lucky enough to uh, obtain a donor organ, uh, they have to live the rest of their lives on immunosuppressive drugs, exposing them to a host of uh, diseases uh, like cancer. So what if we could tackle this massive uh, challenge uh, in a way very similar uh, to this movie scene where we could literally create personalized human tissue to replace damaged or diseased uh, parts inside of our body? Now, only 15 to 20 years ago, this would have been deemed the craziest uh, of science fiction, uh, but we are on a path to ultimately uh, achieving this vision. Uh, in fact, we're seeing a massive paradigm shift in the way that we think of drugs. So a small molecule drugs that we're all very familiar with uh, were once mainstream, but that market is rapidly changing. And the market for biopharmaceuticals, where the drug includes biological substances like antibodies, is rapidly increasing. And now I believe we're entering into the era of regenerative medicine, where we're looking at cells and tissues and organs as the next generation uh, of therapeutics. Similarly, in the medical device world, uh, we're seeing a massive paradigm shift. Medical devices are becoming a lot more custom and a lot more personalized. Major companies uh, are uh, having products that are being approved uh, in terms of devices that are being personalized to a particular patient. Uh, and, and so I ultimately see these massive paradigm shifts converging to ultimately enable uh, the future of therapeutics in the form of living tissue uh, therapeutics that we could print uh, with, with our technology. And so what if we wanted to print a part uh, of a lung, an airway, for example? Well, we'd start off by designing a 3D computer model uh, of an airway. Uh, and we could obtain this from a patient scan uh, just by imaging it using MRI, uh, as we've heard in the previous uh, talk. Now, we would take this uh, patient-derived uh, image and using a machine called a 3D bioprinter, we would transform that software or computer description uh, of, of the tissue into a real living tissue structure. So instead of using non-living materials like plastics and, and ceramics and metals that are using in standard 3D printing, we use real living cells. We take these cells and we combine them with other biomaterials to provide a suitable environment for the cells to grow and differentiate and ultimately uh, behave like tissues uh, in, inside of our body. 
Now, tissues uh, are extremely uh, complicated. Uh, they're made up of many different types uh, of materials, different cells, uh, different growth factors, different extracellular matrix, the environment that the cells grow in. And so to stand a shot at being able to recreate something as complicated uh, as tissues, we need to handle many different types of materials uh, and different complexities uh, in a streamlined approach so we could actually manufacture these. So you might be imagining uh, a scientist in a lab uh, that is handling many different types of materials, different cells, uh, different biomaterials, and they would be switching between many different tools. Uh, this would be very manually intensive, very time consuming, very prone to, to error. And so what we've actually done is we've miniaturized an entire uh, laboratory on a single microfluidic chip. Uh, this chip serves as our printhead, and so this is what we actually uh, use to dispense the many types of materials that are required to create tissues. I'm actually holding uh, one of these uh, chips in my hand. It's about the size of a USB stick. And so what this chip allows us to do is to take uh, all of the different ingredients that make up tissues inside of our body, bring all of these as inputs, and through computer control, we could uh, sequence, we could combine, we could process these materials in real time and then dispense these multi-material, these heterogeneous formulations to create uh, these very complex structures and compositions that make up our tissues. And so here's an example where we were switching between several different biological input materials. We've labeled them different colors here, but these would represent different biological inputs like cells and, and ECM or the extracellular matrix that the cells live in and, and growth factors to take stem cells and differentiate those into either kidney cells or liver cells or, or, or cardiac cells. Uh, so these materials are rapidly dispensed to create these three-dimensional uh, structures that, that are living. And so they're built to mimic the natural arrangement of cells uh, inside of our body. So if we take one of these uh, printed tissue structures and we zoom into uh, one of them uh, at the microscopic level, uh, we could see each individual uh, cell represented by a single uh, green dot. And over time, these cells begin to communicate, and, and they begin to talk, and they form these beautiful 3D interconnected networks. But it's not just that these tissues are living. They're ultimately functioning. They're functioning just like we would expect inside of our body. So to show that with our airway tissues, we're able to take things like histamine, which is released in our body, and we could add histamine to these printed airway muscle tissues, and they begin to contract. Uh, then we could take common anti-asthma therapeutics like salbutamol and we could get these tissues to relax. And so the main message here is that these tissues are functioning just like tissues inside of our body. And so you could imagine how we could print tissues that are personalized to each individual, personalized to you, personalized to me, uh, and we can replace damage function uh, inside of our body. Now, I'd like to give you a couple of examples of tissues that we're focusing on for transplantation. Uh, the first is knee meniscus tissue uh, for surgical therapy. Uh, so the knee meniscus is one of the most commonly uh, damaged parts of the knee. It plays a very important function. It absorbs shock. Uh, and unfortunately, once a damage occurs, it doesn't get better on its own. Uh, it, one of the main reasons is it isn't well vascularized. It doesn't have a blood supply um, that uh, goes throughout the structure. And so once the damage occurs, it just starts to degenerate and it gets worse and worse over time. Uh, current surgical strategies include meniscectomies, where a surgeon will go in and try to remove the damaged part, or in some extreme cases, uh, they'll conduct a full meniscectomy and they'll remove the entire meniscus, which could alleviate the acute pain, but introduces arthritis in the knee. Uh, and so it's literally a massive pain point. Uh, there are no good solutions uh, right now on the market for this problem. Uh, and so what we're focused on doing is we have a vision where somebody who has a meniscus tear or a degenerative meniscus, they would go to the hospital or the doctor's office, we would take an uh, image uh, of their knee uh, using MRI. We'd have that custom geometry. Uh, then we'd take a sample of cells uh, that would be custom to that patient. We would combine the custom uh, geometry and the custom cells. And using our printing technology, using the microfluidic approach, we could take all of those necessary ingredients, all of those materials, and recreate uh, this crescent-shaped structure that plays such an important role uh, inside of our body to help people live active longer uh, in their lives. Uh, and so we would take that tissue and arthroscopically implant it uh, into, into a knee, uh, replacing the damaged part, and the patient would be on their path uh, to recovery. 
Another example uh, of an application that we are working on is in the uh, diabetes space, specifically type 1 diabetes. So this is where we are focused on creating a pancreatic patch uh, for type 1D. Uh, so type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Uh, it involves the immune system targeting and killing the insulin-producing beta cells in our pancreas.